Amen. Um, so if you're a parent or have children or maybe you've got some grandkids or, or maybe you just have some kids that you teach or talk to or try to help or you know what I mean. I mean, it doesn't matter whether or not you're their parent or not. But I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you very clearly, systematically explain to the child, this is what I need you to do. I need you to do this. And then once you do that, I want you to do this. Right? You're just being very clear. You don't, you, the, like if someone heard you explaining it to them, everybody would be like, yeah, I get that. Right? And, and when you say it, usually there's, now go do it. Right? Like, here it is. Now go do it. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but when you say it, the kid usually looks at you like, okay, I'm, I'm tracking, kind of. And then you say, now go do it. And then they say, but, you know what I'm talking about? But, dad, uh, but, but what about, uh, you know what I'm talking about? You, like, you ever had this happen to you where you're just like, here's the, now, now go do it. And they're like, well, but, you know, I'm really tired. I've had a hard day. It's just a lot. My life's so hard. You know what I'm talking about? You ever had this happen? Or maybe as a boss, you've, you've explained it to an employee. You're like, hey, that's what I need you to do. This is step one. This is step two. And then they're like, ah, oh, but, uh, you know, they, oh, but you, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But here's a different experience. Imagine this. You say to the child, you say to the employee, here's what I need you to do. And they say, no problem, I'm on it. You're like, whoo, right? You're excited. They're like, man, I like this employee. I, I like you, kid, again, right? <laughs> like, isn't it amazing? Like, if you say to your children and you say, hey, I need you to go clean that. I need you to go do that. I need you to go pick up your room. I, and they say, no problem, Father. I'd love to help. <laughs> yes? Wouldn't that be amazing? And I'm sure all of your kids do that. I mean, mine absolutely do. They, they, they're very obedient children. Uh, they always respect their father and their mother and the words that come out of our mouths. Uh, we never have any issue with that, you know, like many of you do. Um, <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit today about this concept of the big idea in relationship to something that I just want to call, I just want to call it speedy obedience. Just speedy obedience. And, and I'll, I'll explain what that is in just a moment. But for those of you that are maybe just showing up for the first time today, you might be wondering what this series is about, that what's this we need a big idea all about. And one of the things that I've been trying to kind of talk about over the last few, few weeks is that, that we live in a world that is flooded with information. Isn't that true? I mean, it's information everywhere. And the thing that I've discovered is that we don't have the capacity to process all of the information that's coming at us. And so what can happen is that information actually becomes a problem. Like it can be good. I mean, information is not necessarily bad. But what can happen is you get so much information that what can happen is that you start thinking so much about the information, processing all of the information never do anything with it like you almost get frozen by all the information and because we live in this world that has so much information what I've discovered is that the enemy is using information as a distraction to the people of God that if, if he can get us focused on all of the information and all the stuff and this and that and read this and get that podcast, what can happen is we'll get distracted from the thing that Jesus has actually told us already to do. And we'll spend our time thinking about the past or thinking about the information, but we never do anything with it. One of the other things that I believe the enemy is using right now is something called isolation. We live in a world that you can isolate yourself, can't you? Like, you don't even have to leave, leave your house. You know, you can just call up Amazon or DoorDash or whatever it is, and they'll show up and they'll give you what you need. And most of the time, you don't even have to leave your house. 
And so what's happened is it's created this false sense of self-reliance. Do you know one of the biggest sins in the Bible is self-reliance? It just is. And so one of the things we have to see is that the enemy is not only using information, though information can be good, and isolation to keep us from the things that God wants us to experience. And so here's the phrase that we've used over the last few weeks. The first is, is that, you know, more is not always better. Matter of fact, I'd say less is often more. And so learning that that is true helps us. The other is that we have to understand that real transformation happens when we get in groups. Like real transformation happens in our life when we move from being isolated to where we move to being connected. That true transformation, the way that God defines it, doesn't just happen with you sitting at home reading your Bible, though that's important. It happens when we get connected with other believers experiencing the very power of God together as we study the word, as we build relationships, and as we serve our community. These things are critical for us as we, well, as we follow Jesus. Because Jesus was very clear about this. He was like, hey, I just want to be very clear with you. If you're wondering what it means to be a, quote, Christian, so to speak, he says to us, come and follow me. Very simple, a major big idea. Yes, I mean, that is a big idea. Come and follow me. Very simple, very straightforward. But yet, you can live your entire life feasting on that one idea. That today, this morning, I get up, I follow God. Today, in my marriage, I follow Jesus. Today, in my relationships, I follow Jesus. What is it that you need to follow Jesus in? And Jesus just gives us the simple, big idea that can radically change who we are and what we're about. And so we've been talking about how important it is that we find this big idea that we as people can live on. And, and we've talked about as a church how we want to begin to shift to this kind of model that really focuses in and gains enormous clarity on what it is we're actually talking about. What it is that we're actually saying. And then not just that, but doing something with it. Because is it enough to know the word of God, but to do nothing with it? I mean, Jesus is very clear about this. I mean, the Bible is very clear that to be hearers of the word and to do nothing with it makes no sense. It doesn't make sense at all. What I want to do for a little bit is talk about how we can gain momentum as individuals and as a church when we really begin to practice something. Speedy obedience. Like speedy obedience is really at the heart of gaining the momentum that we all want. All of us want this, I guarantee it. And so as I describe it and as we go, one of the key factors to gaining the momentum that we want in our life is to live a life of speedy obedience. Now, I, I want to share a quote with you from a pastor who pastored one of the largest churches in Argentina. He, he, he made this comment. Now, I'm going to say it a couple of times so you can just let your brain get around it, all right? Because it's a very powerful statement. But this is what Pastor Ortiz said. He said this. He said, the average Christian is educated to at least three years beyond their level of obedience. Let's sit with you for a second. The average Christian, if you're a believer here in this room today, he says, the average Christian is educated to at least three years beyond their level of obedience. Now, what does that mean? What's he getting at? Well, I think he's getting at the fact that we know a lot of stuff. Matter of fact, we got lots of information about God. We live in a world that is full of information about Jesus. The church has done a fabulous job of presenting and providing information. And, and, and so what he's saying is that we have all this information. We've been educated. We've gained knowledge to a point that, that we are well beyond what we may even need. And so he goes on to say that we have three years of knowledge well beyond our level of obedience. So I have knowledge, but I'm not doing anything with it. 
I have three years of knowledge beyond my obedience. You getting it? And so, so as Christians, what can happen is that we get so much information that we're not doing anything with it. And so he says very clearly, the average Christian is educated at at least three years beyond our levels of obedience. I don't know about you, but that makes me uncomfortable. That kind of bothers me a little bit. That somehow I would have all this information, but not necessarily be doing anything with it. There was a time in Pastor Ortiz's church that he literally would preach the exact same message over and over again until he, and this is what he, this is the phrase he uses, until he started seeing his people living the word. That's what he said. Like he would literally get up and preach the same message until he started to see the people living out the word in their lives with one another and in their community. Imagine this. Now, some of you are like, well, I'd leave. That'd be boring. <laughs> That's the same old message. What do you think we are, dumb? I got it, preacher. That's how I hear some of you in my head. <laughs> right? You're like, well, thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh. So they, Pastor Ortiz tells this story about how they were just, and, and this is a, a Pentecostal church in Argentina, so they're fiery, right? Just having a good old time worshiping God, and people are speaking and praying, and the whole thing, right? It's just a rowdy crowd of people, kind of like that song, you know? And they were getting loud. And, and it was one of those moments where it was time for him to get up from his chair and move towards the platform to preach the message. And, and so he was about to do that, and he had this kind of moment with the Lord. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit of it to you. He says, he heard a voice, and the voice said, Juan, which is his first name, Juan. And he said, yes, Lord, how many times have you preached on this passage in this church? That was the question that the Lord asked him. And he goes on and says, well, I don't know, maybe a dozen. Maybe a dozen times I've, I've preached on that. And, he, and as he was about to get up to speak, he heard the same voice say to him, did any of those sermons do any good? <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but as a preacher, I, I don't particularly like that question, Lord. <laughs> kind of presents a little bit of a dilemma, a vocational issue. But somehow the message that I just preached or the messages that I've preached, have they had any impact? Are they doing any good? So the Lord was reading him, right? The Lord was asking some questions and he says that he stood there frozen in time for a moment. And you know what I mean? Because what do you say? It says that all thoughts evaporated from his mind. He looked over his congregation and he saw people that he had led to Christ. He saw people that he had counseled during times of emotional turmoil, as well as people he had visited in the hospital at 2 a.m. when loved ones were clinging to life. He saw people who had heard the Christian message taught over and over again in the Sunday school lessons, small group Bible studies, and even his own sermons. And this is what he says. He says, they knew the words, but still struggled to live out the message. Finally, he said, and this is the craziest part, he gets up on the stage, so he goes from his chair, walks up on the stage, and he just stands before his people, and he says, love one another. And he walks down off of the stage, and he sits down, and then there's this awkward silence. Kind of like this. Came out of a great moment of worship. And there's this awkward silence. And you know, it, it, and now I'm reenacting it. But can you imagine being in that moment? It'd be a little weird. And then a few minutes later, 
pastor walks back up on the stage and he looks at the people and he says, love one another. And then he walks down off the stage and sits down. And then another few minutes go by. And at this point, people are murmuring, you know? They're like, what, what do you think he's up to? What, what kind of game is the pastor playing? You know, what's he, what's he up to, right? And then after a few minutes, he gets up out of his chair, he walks back up on stage, and he says, love one another. <laughs> More awkward silence. Just like this. And then finally, someone in the congregation says, stands up. and says, I, I think I know what pastor's saying. <laughs> and he says, how can I love you if I don't know you? And so I want to introduce myself. He, so he goes over to this person in the, in, the, in the congregation, and he says, hey, I want to introduce myself. My name is, and he, and he says, well, my name is, and, and they have this conversation. He says, I can't love you if I don't know you. And then, and then all of a sudden, and again, this is all happening. The pastor's still standing there, just love one another. Next person gets up and says, well, I can't love Carlos because I have something against him. And I have a grudge against this brother of mine. And so he walks over to me and says, Carlos, would you please forgive me for holding a grudge against you? And then what happens is, like all of a sudden, the congregation starts to just kind of participate in this idea that we should love one another. And, and, and so there's this, it just starts to go out from there and people start having conversations and they start to talk to each other. And then the next thing you know, like there are people there that came to the city because they needed a medical situation. They had a medical situation and someone in the congregation finds out about it. Well, they didn't have the funds that they needed to do the procedure. And so all of a sudden people get together and they start to do something about it. Do you, do you see what is happening? And there's this, this expression of a very big idea love one another very simple very straightforward I love this story it's such a powerful image of what it looks like when the church gets serious about not just knowing stuff but actually doing what Jesus has told us to do that this floodgate opened and all of a sudden the people of God are living out the words love one another and you know what happened in that moment? The preacher was preaching. Well, actually, he was just sharing some information. And I do that. I sit up on this stage and share all kinds of information. But sometimes what happens is the information goes out, but it never leads to transformation. It never leads to application. And so what he was trying to do is say, hey, guys, it's not enough to know stuff. It's not enough to know all the right things. Some of you are well beyond what you need to know to be obedient. Is that okay? This pastor says some of us are three years beyond our obedience. I don't know about you, but that's convicting to me. It makes me think differently. It makes me think, what do I need to be doing? Not just what do I need to be hearing. Not just what do I need to be learning. And again, I'm not against these things. But if these things never lead me to activate the mission of God, if it never leads me to engage the community of faith at a level that it, that it creates in me a transformative experience, then I'm not sure that we're doing it right and I'm not sure we're actually living out what Jesus has called us to live out. And I don't know about you, but I've heard this, and maybe you've even said it. Maybe you have said it to people out loud. But, 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 but it, what can happen is you, 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 you say this, and you say, well, the preacher got up, and he just said, love one another. And then he sat down. And he got back up. He said, love one another. And he sat down. And, 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 and maybe the preacher just keeps preaching the same message over and over again, hoping that people are going to apply it to their life. And then what 
ultimately starts to happen is there's always this person, there's always this human, there's always this fallen creature in need of God that, that says, you know, I just really need something deeper. I just, I need to be a part of a church that's deeper. Now, I don't particularly know what that means. I mean, I'll tell you what I think it means. It usually means that someone's bored with what I'm saying. It might mean that they don't like the way I preach. It might mean that I'm not funny enough for them. It, it can mean a variety of things. I need something deeper. If I preach topical, well, they want it line by line. If I preach it line by line, they want it topical. Who knows? Because human beings... Christians are fickle. They want what they want. And if they don't get what they want, they're like, well, I got to go. Because that's how Christians vote today. They vote with their feet when it comes to the church. We treat the church as some kind of Coke machine. And if we put in the money, we expect to get our drink. Expect to get what we want. And I'll just tell you, I'm just, I'm just being really honest. I'm tired of creating a safe place for selfish Christians. Amen. And I know that stings. Stings me a little bit too. And every time I say that, it's like, well, then I've got to live it. I can't be selfish. I've got to start actually putting these words into practice. If, I, if I'm going to say that publicly and then Christian be like, yeah, pastor, that's right. Make sure you're looking at yourself. Make sure you're not using the church for your own gains. Make sure you're hearing the word of God and the words of Jesus and doing something with it. Please do that. Because if not, you just become a problem. A hypocrite that people look at and say, well, you say a lot of good things, but man, I don't see it in your life. I don't know if this is deep enough for you. <laughs> Sometimes what I hear when people say they need deeper is what I've learned is, is to ask a few questions. How's your time in the word? Are you in a small group? How are you serving anywhere in the church? Oh, and here comes the good one. This is, this is my favorite. Are you tithing? Are you tithing? It's not a suggestion, friends. Are you tithing? And so, after seeing the impact of this sermon that he preached, love one another, <laughs> he determined that he would not preach another sermon that didn't have missional impact. And so he literally, he was known for this, he would literally get up and preach the same sermon over and over until he saw it manifested in the people of God. Think about that for a second. And I suspect that there were people that left because they were tired of hearing the preacher hitting that symbol. Cling, cling, love one another, love one another. Isn't there more? Isn't there more? <laughs> but you know what I think he figured out? I think he figured out that a single big idea that's applied can lead to what I want to call missional velocity. That a single big idea that's applied can lead to missional velocity. Now, I'm going to talk about in that in just a moment, but before we do, we're going to have a pop quiz. Everybody get their papers out and their pens. Some of you are like, no, please. I'm having a nightmare from high school and junior high. I won't make you write it down, but I do want to take just a moment and have a pop quiz, okay? Can we do a, have a little pop quiz? I won't point you out. I won't embarrass you. I promise you. I'm sure your answers will embarrass you enough. <laughs> Just kidding. I want you to read something. And so I want them to bring up Mark chapter 12, uh, verses 29. Go ahead and bring that up, Trenton. Now, just for a moment, read it. I'm not going to read it to you. You read it.
Next verse. Next. Okay, got it? So three questions, right? Three questions. Number one is, do you have any gods before him? Do you have any gods before him? In other words, is there anything in your life right now that's stronger, bigger, and badder than the voice of the Lord? Is there anything sitting on the throne of your life that's, any, that's stronger, has more impact, that you listen to more frequently than the voice of God? Okay? Just think about that for a second. And if you do, what I'm talking about is that you have speedy obedience to eliminate that problem. If there's a person, a thing, an appetite or a desire that is greater than, that's greater than the Lord in your life, then what speedy obedience would mean is that you eliminate it, that you get rid of it, and that you place God back on the center and in the throne of your life. Does that make sense? Very simple. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy, right? I mean, we all know that. We know that it's not easy. But with the power of God living in us and the Spirit of God living in us, then we can do what God has told us to do. Okay, second question. Are you loving him with all the alls? Right, he says all this and all that and all this. Are you loving him in that way? So here, I'll just give you a few examples. Are you attending worship weekly? Well, I know half of you are not. <laughs> Based on the data. <laughs> Pastor, you're making that up. Uh-uh. Facts are our friends. <laughs> are you giving your time to the Lord in worship? Are you using your talents to worship God? Are you giving your treasures unto the king? Now, you may have passed all of them, right? You may have got all those. You're like, yes, I'm with it. I'm getting an A on this pop quiz. Some of you are overachievers. And you're like, oh, yeah. The preacher thought he was going to get me. Then here's the, the last question. Are you loving others as yourself? In other words, are you serving people the way Christ would serve people? Are you loving people the way Christ would love people? Are you in a, a group where you're interacting with other believers, even the ones you don't like, so that you can grow? Because it's not always their problem. It might be you. You see what I'm getting at? Like this is a, literally, I just went this weekend to Joyce Meyer's women's conference, which is kind of interesting. I'm a dude and I was at the women's conference. <laughs> and that particular night, she was preaching on love. And she was just talking about how we are called by God to love people. And it was good. I was like, oh, yeah. And she was talking about how she wants to spend the rest of her life trying to figure this out, how to love people. And, and just love people, right? Just love them. Even if they're messed up and broken. How do I do that? How, how do I do that the way Jesus would want? And it, 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 it's inevitable. You leave a conference, and today something will happen to you. You will leave here today, and something I'm saying will be challenged out there. It's called an integrity check. In other words, did I hear it and am I going to do anything with it? It's an integrity check that God brings into your life to say, okay, you made a commitment, now what are you going to do with it? And so literally, I leave this conference and I totally forgot. 
I totally forgot that they had shut down 55 South. Now, I know that that may not seem like a big deal to you. It was a big deal to me that night. I was in special parking. And so I didn't have to deal with all the traffic. And for some reason, I went right when I should have went left. And I see it. Just so many cars. <laughs> they were everywhere. The highway was shut down. And I thought to myself, what have I done? I'm never getting out of here. Now, if you know me, I, I'm, I sometimes I'm not the most patient individual. Still working on that one, too. <laughs> and I'm sitting in these, this traffic, and I can just feel my energy getting bigger and stronger and emotional. And the people around me, I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> They're all crazy. Honking and swerving and trying to cut you off. Come on. I mean, just, and I was up to here. I finally turned left. And I turned right. And I thought, maybe I'm home free. And it says, detour. And I was so upset. And then this lady, this lady, decided to pull around me. Like, where are you going? We're all in the same place. Pulls around me. And I have to tell you, I may have said something that I regret saying. My children were in the car. I'm sure none of you have done this. And then, I did it. I honked. <laughs> I did it. And this lady swerves in front of me, and then she puts her hand out of her window <laughs> and waves at me. But she had peeled the banana, if you know what I'm saying. And I so wanted to get out of my car and walk up there and be like, what is your problem, woman? I totally did. On the heels of hearing a message about loving. Now I share that with you. Just to say I'm just like you. But. I can be better. And I think half the battle is just recognizing that you, you're stupid. <laughs> or you screwed it up. I mean it really is. Half the battle is just being able to see that you did it wrong. And then humble yourself and say, you know what, I did that wrong. I shouldn't have said that. Now, I couldn't do anything to that woman, you know. I, I couldn't walk up to her because she'd probably think I was going to choke her or something. I couldn't be like, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I didn't mean to honk at you for going in front of me. I mean, in the midst of this traffic jam, right? See the sarcasm? <laughs> like, it's still in there. I'm still working through this. <laughs> but at least I'm working. I'm working. And maybe next time I'll do it better. Maybe I'll be more aware. Maybe I'll know that on the back heel of a message on love that I was going to get challenged right as I walked out the door. That I anticipate the battle. You know what I mean? And so there's something about the words of Jesus that are so simple and so straightforward. And, and, and he just wants us to live it. He doesn't want us to pass this pop quiz. He doesn't care like you're not going to get to heaven and he's be like okay pull out your pencils number two pencils that's what we use in heaven <laughs> I 
get the scantrons out <laughs> some of you are old enough to know the scantron <laughs> no he's going to say when you saw this person what did you do unto the least of these did you do anything did you offer this person kindness or did you offer them anger because I can tell you this and this is the saddest part of this story is that there's a good chance that if I ever met this woman she would not listen to me because of my testimony do you understand that every time we do something stupid as Christians we potentially hurt our ability to share the gospel with someone else it's a big deal that we would be the light of Christ to the world. We could stop there. We've got a few more minutes. So some of you remember eighth grade science? I, I don't know about you, but like I did uh, physical science. Is that what y'all did in eighth grade? I did physical science. Some of you did biology. No, wait, it was ninth grade. Ninth grade was physical science. Some of you did biology in eighth grade. I don't know what they teach in Missouri, but, but, but I took physical science. I hated it. Just hated it. It was like, you know what I'm talking about. It's like the stuff where it's like motion, stays in motion, and, you know, and Newton, and, you know, all those big guys that tell you stuff about stuff that don't make sense. You know what I mean? Well, let's talk about that for a second. So scientifically speaking, movement equals, listen, mass times velocity. Remember this? Some of you are like, uh, no, I don't. And I really don't even know what that means. But basically what it's saying is that if you have mass and you have velocity, you can get movement. Make sense? So, 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 so there's something about having the mass and the velocity together that can lead to movement. Now, why is this important? Well, because think about it this way. If you have mass with no velocity, then that object is stationary, right? It just sits there. It has no speed. It just sits there. It's mass. So it's like this doll. This doll has mass, yes? Yes. Now, if this doll never moves, right, has no velocity, then it's just stationary. Makes sense. Yeah, you guys are smart. You get this. If my teacher would have explained it this way, I'd have probably got it. Just saying. But then if you have velocity without any mass, so you have no doll, then, then really you have motion, but it has no ability to make any impact. Is that making sense? Okay. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, earlier I mentioned something to you called missional velocity. How do we get missional velocity in our lives? How to, do we take what Jesus has given us and get the kind of energy and movement that we all long to have. Well, it, it's not from just standing there as a mass. Like you might be a mass. Yep, you're a human. You're, you take up space, you're a mass. Some of us are bigger masses than others. But we're a mass. So, so that's true. And if you get a bunch of masses together, you get a church which makes a bigger mass. You remember this, the old song, right? You get the fingers. What is it? Anybody want to sing it for me? How's it go, Jen? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open up the doors and see all the people. Yes, that's right. So you get one mass with a bunch of other masses. You get a church. Make sense? Everybody's getting it. So having a mass is not the problem. Jesus changed the world with 12 masses called the disciples. So if we have 12, then we've got plenty to change the world. So the mass isn't the problem. 
We've got the mass. We've got what we need, except we lack speed. We lack velocity. We lack directional intentionality to accomplishing what God has called us to accomplish. Jesus has been clear. Love people. Love me. Follow me. These are big ideas that Jesus presented to us that are not complicated. And what he's saying is, I need us as the mass to begin to operate very purposefully towards the mission that God has called us to do. And when that happens, what happens is we gain the missional velocity we need. So if this guy is sitting right here and he does nothing, he just is a mass in creating religious or holy masses. He wants the mass to do something. Now, if this mass was supposed to hit, let's say Caleb is my target. Caleb's sitting right here in the front row. So Caleb's my target. If, if this mass was supposed to hit that target and he went like this. You ready? Are you ready? Yes. Ready? Go. Now, he moved. The mass moved. He had speed. But he didn't hit his target. You see what I'm getting at? It's not enough just to speed. It's not enough to just move. It's not enough to just be a mass that's doing stuff. What God has called us to do is be a mass that hits the target. So I... See what happened? He had speed, velocity towards a particular target, which is the mission of God. These are the things that God wants us to understand. Throw me back my doll. So as a church, we have the mass, but what we need is velocity. We need missional velocity towards the things that God has called us to do. Not things that we make up, not things that we make too complicated, but things that God has specifically said, these are the things you need to be doing. And he calls us to do that by simply giving us big ideas and telling us to do something with it. But here's the problem, is we lack speedy obedience. Because if we never are obedient to what he's actually said, we won't ever achieve. We never will hit the target. We'll never gain the missional velocity that we want. Because see, what happens sometimes, do you ever do this? I sometimes do this. Jesus says to do something, like in his word, he's like, here, do this, love people. And then I don't do it. Or, here's the best one, we make up excuses, or we say, well, you know, my mom hurt me. My dad hurt me. I grew up in a really difficult place. And I'm not discounting that. But what happens is they become our excuses to being obedient to loving people. And God says to you, hey, I want to heal that in you, kids, so that you can love people the way that I love people. He never gives us that out. And so if we don't understand that God has a very specific plan for us, and if we don't take the big ideas that Jesus teaches us and use those big ideas or apply those big ideas, we will never gain missional, missional velocity in our lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's why I'm talking to you today about speedy obedience. That when God says something, you should do it. That when his word tells you to do something, you should do it. You shouldn't make excuses. You shouldn't blame. You should just simply say, you know what, Jesus, you probably know better. How many times in our lives have we thought we knew better than God? Well, you probably never said it out loud. But perhaps he's told you to do something and you were like, no, none of us, of course. And see, if we could take these big ideas that we learn on the weekend and apply them together, imagine the kind of missional velocity we could gain. Imagine if we used these kinds of big ideas in our small groups where we talked about it and then not just talked about it, but we actually did something with it. Imagine the kind of impact we could make. It would no longer be about learning stuff. It would be about doing what God has told us to do and making the impact. Because let me ask you this. Do you think this world needs more, more uh, words? Needs more Christians with words? We've got plenty of words. 
Matter of fact, I think we have some of the best words. But nobody really cares what you say unless you're living it. And I'm not saying there's not a time and a season for words. I'm just simply saying that if you're not living it out, then what do you have to say? You claim the name of Christ for what reason? You're making everything harder for me if you're not living it out. Is that fair? I, come on, guys. I mean, I know this is hard teaching, but it seems fair. It seems reasonable that if you're going to claim the name, you should live it out or at least try to take the big ideas of Jesus and apply them. And so here's the deal. As a church, we are committed to this. And so we are going to spend the remainder of our time together over the next few years spending time understanding the big ideas of Jesus and trying to make them uh, or, or applying them in our lives, in our community, in our small groups, in our ministries, in our families, in our kids, in our, in our team. See, if we could get all of this working, what can happen is we would have focus light, directional and missional velocity with big ideas that Jesus gives us. And can you imagine the impact that we could make? Whew. I don't know about you, but that sounds exciting. We need to stop measuring maturity as a Christian by, Christ, by church attendance. Now, you should come to church. Don't get me wrong. But we need to measure our maturity by the speedy obedience of our life. That's how we should measure maturity in Christ. And so, as we close, my heart for us today is that speedy obedience would be something that we demonstrate in our lives. Because if we ever want to gain the momentum that God wants us to gain, we have to apply it strategically in the way that he's told us to do it. Let's pray together. As we begin to pray, I want to ask you a question, just really quick. Where has God told you to do something that you're not doing? Where has the Holy Spirit specifically said, hey, I want you to do something with this? And currently it sits there. Where have you read in the word of God that he wants you to do something and it still sits there? Where have you heard a message by your pastor and God spoke to you and it still sits there? Now, this is between you and God. But I know that if we don't take what God has told us to do and apply it, it'll still sit there. God wants you to say yes so that you can experience the abundant life that he brings you. But he has no interest in you doing it your way. It's his will, his way. He's Lord. So I want to pray for anybody in the room that feels like they have something sitting there. God, I pray for anybody in this room that feels like they have something that they really need to act on, that you've told them to do. Jesus, I ask that you would empower them to take that first step, 
even if it's scary, even if it scares them immensely, God, that they would take a step of faith towards you and do what you've asked them to do. That their mass would be connected with missional velocity so that momentum could be gained in their life, in the church, and in the kingdom of God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to simply ask this question. Part of obedience is recognizing that Jesus Christ gave his life for all of humanity. And the Bible says that when you see love like that, the only reasonable response, the only reasonable response is to love him back. And so, I just want to ask if there's anybody here in this room today that maybe needs to take that step of obedience to say yes to the finished work of Jesus Christ that when he went to that cross to die for your sins and my sins that he loved us that much and that he desires a relationship with us. He desires to help us get back to God. I mean, all of these things are true. But he asks that you'll say yes. That you put your faith and trust in him today. And if you will, I want to lead you in a prayer. So, church, let's, let's all pray together. I don't want anybody to feel left out or alone. And so, if you're here today and this is your desire, I just want to pray for you. And so, guys, let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I need a Savior. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you wash me clean? I choose this day to follow you. Will you be Lord of my life? Will you fill me with your Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey guys, if you gave your life to the Lord, if you said yes to Jesus, as we spend a few more minutes worshiping together, I just want to encourage you to do something. On that Connect card that maybe is under your seat or in the seat back in front of you, I'd love for you to fill that out and just put your name there. And again, this isn't about just getting attendance. It's about us trying to help you take your next steps. We want to help you take that next step. And it's so easy to get lost. And so we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And so would you mind filling that out? And as we sing and as we pray at this last moment, I'd invite you to take it over to, to one of the prayer stations and simply give that to somebody. Now, if you can't do that, that's too much for you. At least drop it in the kiosk as you leave in these bo the boxes at each of the doors so that we can get you connected, get you connected in the church and get you the things that you need to get started, okay? All right, well, let's stand on our feet. I wanna pray for us as we sing together this last song. God, we thank you so much for your presence among us. Lord Jesus, you're good. We thank you for your word and how it shapes and challenges us, Jesus. But Father, just for a moment, we want to respond back to you as your word gives us truth and life. We want to worship you. And so Jesus, we want to lift your name high in these moments together. In Jesus' name.